the First Congregational UCC here in Union City, Michigan. It's a pleasure to be worshiping with you all today. And my name is Don Mason. I'm the pastor here. And it is always a good day to be gathered in God's house. I get my notes open. I will be ready to talk. No matter who you are, and no matter where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here, and we're glad to be worshiping together today. I would hope that you've had a chance to review the announcements that are printed in the bulletin. If you have announcements that you'd like to share with the congregation, please try to get them into the office by Wednesday so that we can have them to put in front of people on Sunday mornings like this. Uh, We've got a number of things coming up in the next few uh, weeks in the life of the congregation, so pay attention to the chimes and pay attention to the announcements. But two weeks from today, there's going to be a picnic down at Riverbend Park. Everybody's welcome. I hope that you'll participate and uh, look for those details uh, in next week's bulletin if they're not here yet. Um, let's, I'd, I'd like to invite Kelly to share a little bit with the uh, Strength of the Church offering. Good morning. Good morning. Today in the bulletin you will find your Strength in the Church offering. The Strength of the Church offering reflects the shared commitment of people across the United Church of Christ to cooperatively build up the UCC. Conferences and national setting equally share the gifts given by members and friends through their local congregations. The funds raised support leadership development, new churches, youth ministry, and innovative in existing congregations. By your generosity to this offering, you build up the body of Christ. The Strength of the Church offering supports grants which make a difference in the lives of people across the United Church of Christ. The Keep and Till Congregation in the Central Atlantic Conference honors royal life and faith by focusing on agrarian rhythms, ecological concerns, and creation care. The Keep and Till received a grant to stabilize and improve their community garden during the pandemic. The Strength in the Church offering supports congregations making critical adaptations. During the last year, several congregations sought help updating their technology to be able to connect with people when not worshiping in person. The Strength in the Church offering provided critical support to congregations and their community partners during the COVID pandemic. Moving forward, grants from Strength in the Church offering will help congregations pivot towards church renewal and community engagement. Part of Strength in the Church offering also supports youth and young adult ministry. 2020 scrambled many plans for such ministries, including the delay of a much appreciated national youth event. Youth and young adult ministers wondered how to effectively reach out during the pandemic and sought peer support. As God calls our congregation to be the church in new ways, your generosity will plant new churches awaken new ideas in existing churches, and develop the spiritual life in our youth and young adults. So please consider making um, a contribution to strengthen the church. We'll be collecting uh, this week and next week, or um, if you're watching online, you can send in your check to the church. You can put on the memo, um, strengthen the church. Thank you. Let's continue our worship then with the ringing of the bell.
please join with me to pray the opening prayer. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. In old age they still produce fruit. They are always green and full of sap, showing that the Lord is upright. God is my God, in whom there is no unrighteousness. Amen. Well, I know that we don't have any young in age people here. We have a lot of young in heart people here. So you're going to have to help me because um, I have some questions to ask. So who here knows what a parable is? Yeah, okay. So for those of you who don't know what a parable is, it's a way of teaching a lesson and being able to show how it works. Like for example, not everybody knows what six means unless you're shown six things. Like I have today, six clementines. So I have six clementines in here. Whoop, now I have five. <laughs> so if I have if I asked you what 6 minus 2 equals 4, those are just words, right? Unless you know what 6 means, and 2 means, and 4 means. So I'd say, I have 6 clementines. I'm going to take away 2, and how many do I have left? I have 4 left, right? So that is what a parable is like. It is learning a lesson by having an example. So in the Bible, and one of the things that Pastor Don is going to talk about today, is the parable of the mustard seed. Now, I happen to have a jar of mustard seeds, and you may not be able to see at home, but they are teeny, 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 <laughs> tiny. They're really little. They're teeny tiny. <laughs> That's how small they are. <laughs> so Jesus used mustard seeds as one of his parables. And I'm going to read it so I make sure I don't mess up. He said, How can I describe the kingdom of God? What story should I use to illustrate it? It's like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It's the smallest of seeds, but it becomes the largest of all plants in the garden. It grows long branches, and birds can make nests 
in its shade. So I wanted to look up how big a mustard plant grew because I didn't know. It grows to be about three feet tall and it's very bushy and um, full of green leaves. So that's a pretty big plant for a garden. Think about the gardens that we grow here. I mean, we have corn that's tall, but it's not big and bushy like the way that they describe a mustard plant. So think of that, something that big out of one of these tiny little seeds. Well, when you think you are too small or too young to be doing anything to help God out, you can remember that you're like a mustard seed. You might be this teeny tiny little seed, but a work that you do that is helping someone or telling someone about Jesus or God, that you don't know may grow into this huge bush. Just like Jesus' helpers were 12 people. And now look, it's all over the world. And maybe you could do that someday too when you are from a little tiny mustard seed and through everything you do, become, help become a huge, uh, beautiful plant. So let's pray. Dear God, Dear God thank you for the mustard seed. So it can remind us that no matter how small we are, we can do mighty things. In your name we pray. Name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amber. <laughs> Today we're going to read in the Gospel according to Mark in the fourth chapter, verses 26 through 34. Actually, a couple of different parables. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself First the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe at once, he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them. As they were able to hear it, he did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. May God add a blessing to our hearing and understanding of this, the Holy Word of God. Amen. Didn't you just love dandelions growing up? And it brings a smile to a lot of people's faces thinking of dandelions as a child, right? How you can hold them under your chin and make it reflect their golden glow. Wait a minute, is that daisies or buttercups instead of dandelions most times? Dandelions, okay, cool. Whether you like butter or not, right? That's what, yeah, all right, all right. How about when you break open their husks and stems and they weep white liquid? Wait, no. Well, they, they do, the stems of dandelions have a little bit of a white liquid in there, but it's mostly milkweed, I think, that does that really white liquid, right? Oh, how about um, dandelion wine, right? How many of you have had some dandelion wine lately? Well, hey, that's all right. Um, 
I happen to think that grapes are a little bit more effective <laughs> than dandelions in making wine. Uh, but I could be wrong. I'm, I'm sure there are aficionados of dandelion wine that just absolutely wouldn't drink anything else, right? Um, but most magical dandelion lore comes from blowing on its seed head while you make a wish and watch that wish be carried off by the four winds. A gift to the universe. Wish for peace, everybody, please. And then see your fussy neighbor scowl <laughs> as most of the now liberated seeds fall right directly into his yard. But friends, I think the dandelion also brought me and millions of children a very early lesson in transformation and wonder. As one day when you look out in your yard, there's just a few blades of green foliage, and then maybe the next day a yellow flower, and then soon afterwards that ball of seedlings being scattered by nature. Like the farmer that Jesus was talking about, though. Where do they grow? Where do they go? How do they grow? And for millions of homeowners disturbed by the yellow spots in their precious green expanses, how in the world do we get rid of them? Well, for many people, dandelions are nothing but weeds and annoyances. But I think it was one of the ways that I first recognized how the system works, was looking at dandelions and seeing that, because you can see the seeds, but you can also see how they're scattered. And it's not just us that do the scattering. Uh, we don't know when people noticed the relationship between seed and plant. It's clearly a symbiotic relationship between us and the earth that uh, probably predates even tool technology. People could harvest and plant seeds without a hoe, without any stone tools. So people probably from as soon as we started becoming a little bit more intelligent than the other critters in the world, realized that these things here, when you drop them to the ground, becomes something entirely different. In the second of Jesus' parables of soil and seeds, in just this fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel, there's a dash of mystery in the narrative. At the beginning of chapter 4, Jesus tells us that most familiar parable about the, so the, the sower, right? Sower went out to sow and seed, fell on the, plant, on, the, on the good soil, the bad soil, the path, all that other stuff. That happens in the fourth, at the beginning of the fourth chapter. And then Jesus comes to this spot and he says, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about seeds and soil. Uh, but this time the farmer is my main character. He talks about a farmer that's constantly vigilant over his garden, as if he had no knowledge of this problem. After he does the planning, he's night and day checking on it. Okay, what's it look like today? I got to check in the middle of the night. Is it going to dry out? Is there something going to happen to my plants, my soil, my seeds? What's going on? How's this happen? Oh, what's that? Is that a weed? Is that a plant? We fuss about our gardens, don't we? And this is a fussy farmer. In the first parable about the sower, the sower doesn't care. The sower just throws seeds indiscriminately. That second farmer, he's the one that cares. He's tending to the plants. He watches it every day until it's exactly the right time to harvest. You see the stalk, the stem, the green, the grain, the head. Now it's time. Grab it. Let's go with it. The best time 
to receive the harvest has come. See that first parable, Jesus says, even though some of it fell on the ground, what fell in the good soil reaped an abundant harvest, an unimaginable harvest, a hundred times what they would have expected to receive from that, to make up for the seed that was spoiled or wasted or didn't grow properly. But in the second parable, it's not about the natural processes. It's about the timing of the farmer. Timing is everything. You need to know the best time, and you need to pay attention to when the best time is to bring that sickle so that you protect all the hard work that you put in, and you can actually make that abundant harvest happen. Because we know that if we don't protect some of our growing things in our garden, they're just going to go to waste. And some of it does anyway. Because our gardens kind of produce so abundantly that we can't harvest it all, right? Zucchinis. <laughs> tomatoes. Later this summer, everybody's going to have tomatoes from their garden, and nobody's going to know where to put all of them if they don't can. And zucchini, I don't know how well you can can zucchini. There, I'm sure there's a way. But now we come to the weedy part. Because the weedy part is in the third half of these seed and soil, soil stories. Unlike dandelion seeds, which can grow into cute little weeds, mustard seeds grow to full-grown shrubs so big that they become shelter for the birds. And elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus mentions how an enemy might sow mustard seeds into the vineyard to sabotage his competitor's harvest. But this story, this story of the mustard seed is an instant summary. One of those all-time classic Jesusisms, right? You mentioned the parable of the sower, or the, 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 the parable of the sower. Sometimes people get that, sometimes they don't. When you mention the parable of the mustard seed, every seed, mustard seed, tiny seed, grows to a big shrub. Everybody knows that, right? It's easy. Just ask somebody. If you say, do you remember the parable of the mustard seed? They trigger that knot of the head, and nothing else needs to be said about it. But obviously, by the end of this lesson, we really should all, if we look at this scripture closely, we should all be scratching our heads and trying to figure out what exactly Jesus means, really, because it closes with, with many such parables. He spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Jesus, we're right able to hear it, but as they were able to hear it, he did not speak to them except in parables but he explained everything in private to his disciples. It's not very satisfying, is it? This is the public ministry of Jesus. He's telling us all these things, and then, oh, but I'll tell you the secrets someplace else in private, not in front of all of the rest of you. But this one's easy, right? Tiny. Mustard seed, tinier than a carrot seed? I don't know. I don't know if Jesus ate carrots. <laughs> he might not have. But it grows to become huge. So a seed of faith can grow into a life-encompassing relationship with God. Enough said. Everybody nod your heads and on we go. But faith unfortunately, isn't the only tiny seed that gets sown in our lives. Sometimes we have seeds of doubt that can be nearly indistinguishable from our seeds of faith. And then we have the seeds of lies that sprout up right along the seeds of truth. And sometimes they seem to share the same roots because a lie to somebody 
is a truth to somebody else with the same facts. And then we have seeds of fear that try to overpower our seeds of comfort and security. And where's Jesus? Privately explaining this to the other disciples. Wait a minute. That just doesn't seem right, does it? But Jesus is no longer here to explain all of them to us in private, in person. So we have to rely on our understandings of the scriptures and the way that we bring our lives to bear in these scriptures and the way these scriptures come to life in us. Not as they were said and written down by generations of people before and written down in all kinds of different languages and all kinds of different ways and all kinds of different circumstances and responses to all kinds of different pressures and stressors in their lives. We have our own set of all that that we're trying to cope with, Jesus. So stop with all the privacy related to this stuff. Tell us. Jesus, in this 21st century garden that we're trying to grow, how do we manage this constant stream of seeds? Because they all have the potential to grow in the shrubs of immense proportions. And our role as God's people isn't just to say, oh, well, leave well enough alone because it'll get taken care of itself, right? Jesus gives us a huge clue at the beginning of this conversation with his disciples when he says, remember that farmer who threw the seeds in his indiscriminately and had all kinds of seed to share and had an abundant harvest? It did not come that easy. He had to sleep and wait night and day and tend to that garden and pay attention to what's going on in the world to pay attention to what's going on in his life pay attention to the way that the things are growing what shapes they're taking pay attention and learn and know and trust and grow because just because you've heard this story 10 times before doesn't mean it's the same story that you heard 10 times ago just because you've grown this garden 10 years in a row doesn't mean it's the same garden you were tending to 10 years ago. Because you've changed in your habits. You've changed in the way that you deal with things. You've changed and grown and become a new person completely. They say our body replaces all its cells in how long? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take long. Because when you keep vigil, when you marvel at how things grow, when you harvest the good things at the right time, and you trust that those that have grown can shelter, overshadow, and inform everything that we struggle to contain. So let your faith contain your joy. Let your faith contain your growth. Let your faith inform everything that you struggle with. And let your faith be that place where you're as tiny as a board, a bird in, com in comparison to all the troubles that you have. And it protects you and shelters you and makes you grow. Amen.
as we think about how our lives have changed, how we have grown, how we have become the shrubs and the plants that we are through our relationship with the church over many, many years. I hope that we can continue to be generous towards this congregation and towards each other by sharing in the burden of making things run and work and grow here at First Congregational in Union City. A lot of ways you can do that. And then there's a lot of ways that you can reach out through this church to other congregations as well because there are places in the world that need to hear our message and our truth and our love and our growing conversations with each other so that, uh, so that we can all uh, practice our faith a little bit more centrally in all that we do. You may contribute by your time, your talent, your prayers, and your giving. Uh, we have plates at the front and the back of the sanctuary. You can also mail in checks or use tightly. Uh, but let us give with generosity that God's goodness may be known in the world. Let us pray. Generous God, take our gifts this day and use them so that we may be part of your great work in this world. Through our giving of time, talent, and treasure, bring justice and love closer to all, not just in our community, but in the world beyond these walls. Strengthen our church so that we grow together each day into a powerful voice for healing and peace. Amen. We have uh, quite a number of prayer concerns. Uh, I know there's been a particular concern in our community for those who uh, have known Linda Waite and her participation in the life of our, con our community. Uh, prayers of healing uh, for many people prayers of recovery, prayers of uh, overcoming health issues, prayers of grief, and then also our prayers of love and joy. Uh, successful diaper drive, we have a couple more packs of diapers out there to add to the number, so uh, we're glad to have uh, 708 diaper changes that parents can make, wow. <laughs> a little bit of rain, we need some more, and uh, just the joy in being able to gather with other folks and, um, and taking off our masks so that people can see our whole faces, some of us, and uh, protecting one another by wearing our masks as we need to, you know, that's the, that's the joy of, uh, of being in a diverse gathering of people. So I rejoice in all these things. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. Gracious God, you touch and bless our lives in so many different ways, so many loving ways, so many uh, valuable ways that we can't count them all. We can't count our blessings, nor can we count our sorrows but we trust that all of them given to you are transformational. These are pain, these are grief. Increase our joy, increase our comfort. Show us your truth in times of misunderstanding or challenging conversations. Allow your growth to occur in the lives of your congregations, especially the small seed ones. 
allow your church to grow through people's hearts and minds and lives. Allow us to continue in mystery, recognizing that there is a, an unclaimed part of our souls where you dwell. Walk with us through each day. Grant us your peace, your promise, your love. Through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power. Now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.